Okay, uh, good evening everybody. Um, uh, we're getting quite comfortable with this. My name is Alan Friedman, Vice President of the Australian Jewish Association, and I'm again joined uh, tonight by Michael Bird, my former co-host of Nothing Left. Good evening, Michael. It's nice to be back uh, again for another one of these AJA events. Yeah, good evening, Alan. Good evening, David. We're still, uh, for, uh, for our listeners or viewers out of Australia, we're locked in Victoria, we're locked up in jail. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're, we're under house arrest. Um, also visible on your screen, as Michael mentioned, is David Adler, President of the AJA. And tonight will be pretty much the same as before. Michael and I will chat with Martin for about 30 minutes, after which we will open up the discussion with the live Q&A session from the audience. Uh, as usual, the, uh, the chat function is available for general comment, so please feel free to send messages to the audience during the discussion. And if you're not sure how to do this, just click on the chat uh, icon at the bottom uh, of your screen in the middle of the toolbar, and that will open up the chat window. Um, we've got everybody muted to prevent uh, annoying noises during the first part of the session, but we will allow people to unmute themselves for question time. Michael? Yes, okay, we're ready to start. Let's get on to business. Martin Sherman is the founder and CEO of the Israel Institute for Strategic Studies, an Israeli think tank whose aim is to promote the development of sound policies that further global peace and security, particularly in relation to Israel and the Arab world. Martin is known for his forthright views on what Israel should be doing in Judea and Samaria, which we will hear about tonight in the context of the Trump peace plan. Martin is a prolific writer and his articles appear regularly in all the online magazines that arrive in our inboxes and he appears frequently on Israeli current affair TV shows and was a regular guest of ours on Nothing Left. Martin, good evening, our time and thanks for joining us. Well, uh, good day to you guys. It's um, midday here, so wherever you are, I, I hope it's a good day or a good evening. Yeah, Martin, look, it seems like a lifetime ago when you and I were sitting down having lunch in Jerusalem. I think it was either last year or the year before. Um, it seems a long time now. When do you think uh, I'll be able to have another lunch with you in Jerusalem? <laughs> well, <laughs> I hope it will be still this year. Who knows? We can, maybe we can flatten the curve in time. Well, I'm a bit disappointed in you Israelis. I would have thought that you guys would come up with a vaccine by now. So you're, you're letting the team down. So I reckon you guys should be working a bit more over time. No. Okay. My apologies. Now, that's okay. Now, Martin, the latest reports indicate that the whole extension of sovereignty issue has now been put on hold by the Israeli government. Um, what can you tell us about this? It seems the US administration has lost momentum here. What might be the reasons behind this? Is a lack of Jewish uh, support also a problem? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that if there was an enthusiastic wall-to-wall -wall Jewish uh, support for this, uh, for this initiative, it would be much easier to implement. But uh, you know, I, I must confess that in, in many ways I've not been able to decipher the logical code that drives the Israeli policy for the last two decades or so, perhaps even more. Uh, because I, I really believe, well, you know, put it this way, certainly the, uh, the COVID-19 is, is a serious issue which takes up a lot of uh, uh, leadership time, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, you know, the, the system can only stand uh, so much strain at a given moment. But having said that, I still think that in many ways, having the distraction of COVID-19, this might be an ideal time to go forward with the annexation because people are otherwise occupied. And then, uh, as the title that you put out says, this is a, a, an urgent imperative for Israel. And the reticence for me is, is, is very puzzling. Uh, I don't think that Israel has been uh, assertive enough and, uh, in, in, in its uh, policy vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinian issue. Um, you know, uh, in many ways it seems for instance, like with the uh, the uh, recognition of Jerusalem and the, the move of the embassy to to Jerusalem, this was more 
an American initiative, which Israelis you know, gratefully accepted, but didn't initiate. And um, I, I think in, in many ways, you, the, the root of all evil is Israel's dismal performance in presenting its case to the world. As, as you guys at AJ and uh, Nothing Left Before know, I've, I've been on record for many years saying that Israel is being very, very almost derelict in its, in its duty in presenting its case to the international, uh, to the international audience. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, Israel spends a pitiful, a pitiful amount of uh, resources presenting its case. And as I pointed out before, that if it was to spend 1% of state budget, that would be over a billion dollars. Now, with a billion dollars, you can win a lot of hearts and change a lot of minds. Uh, and, and, and I think that, that, that Israel has really, in, in many ways, been a burden on itself in getting this important initiative implemented. Mm -hmm. Martin, um, we're all sort of sitting around and, and hearing that we're waiting for the Americans to, to, to do or say something. What, are, what exactly are they waiting for and when, exact, when exactly is it likely to be announced? Well, uh, again, you know, I, I don't have any, any authoritative answers to that. But again, one would think that for Israel to do this well before the, the uh, November elections uh, this year would be better than to wait for the elections to happen. Because before the elections, Trump is very dependent on the evangelical uh, Christian community there or very pro-Israel, very pro-annexation. And if you wait too long until the elections are over, when Trump no longer needs that support from the evangelicals, you may have missed a very important card in your, in, in, in your, uh, in, in, in your bank. So mm. as I say, I, I, I'm having difficulty as much as you are with understanding uh, this reticence. You know, with, with, all, with, with all the understanding that I have for Netanyahu and everything he's got, his, on his, everything he's got on his plate at the moment, uh, I do think that he may be letting the opportunities slip by instead of striking whilst the iron is hot. Yeah, I, I wonder, uh, are the Americans perhaps waiting for Benny Gantz to, to say something? And what's, what's his position on all of this? Well, again, you know, there's this, this, coalition, this coalition agreement that they need uh, a unanimous uh, agreement on any initiative like that. So they may be waiting for that, but Benny Gantz has basically been totally eroded away as a political force. If you look at uh, the elections, uh, the, uh, sorry, the, the opinion polls, the last thing Benny Gantz needs now is an election because he's, you know, he's uh, in single digits, polling single digits. Uh, so he's really not a threat to Netanyahu. In fact, this whole agreement is becoming more and more lopsided. So. You know, I, I, I'm not quite sure why the Americans are giving uh, guns this uh, exaggerated weight, because ba basically in terms of, of, of uh, the constituency in the electorate is uh, something like one quarter of Netanyahu. Um, you know, I suppose they would, they, they would like to present this as a view that has a wide consensus in Israeli society. But... Uh, Again, uh, I'm not sure. Basically, Netanyahu doesn't need American agreement. What he needs to do is annex, uh, and, and that will be it. He doesn't, even really, he doesn't even really need, as far as I understand, uh, approval of the Knesset. He can do this by, by government edict. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're, we're coming back to the same point. Why is Netanyahu so, so timid? And I believe that all this goes back to what I said before. Uh, there isn't enough resolve. There isn't enough self-confidence. Uh, in Israel pursuing its interests because it has been so dismal in presenting its case uh, on the international stage. Mar Martin, uh, just uh, sorry for but can, uh, can you see if you can clear up the sound a bit? There's a little bit of echo on coming from your end, just to make how it... Do, how would I do that? I can put, I, a, I can put a, a, a earphone on with a, with a microphone. Have you got yeah. an external microphone? Maybe just bring it a little closer to you. Mm. Okay, let's we'll try that. How's that? That that's I think that's better. 
Yes. Um, so, so, Martin, the, the question is, has this whole thing been put on ice or is it still running, this whole issue? I think at the moment that everyone here, if you look, if you, if you watch the news in Israel, uh, three quarters of it is, uh, is the corona issue, the, the COVID-19. So I, th I think in any, and, and of course the economic situation that has been, uh, that's been derived from, from the, the shutdown and, and the, the restrictions that people are under. But um, I, I, I think it's just been pushed on the, the back burner because of, of well, what's going on at the moment. I don't know that there's been any conscious decision to put it on a back burner. And if there has been, I think that would be very unfortunate because as I say, we're, 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 we're basically running against the clock with the, with the elections in, uh, in, in, in the US because if the democratic government is, is elected, uh, and that, that's, that really could be a doomsday scenario. Well, ob uh, obviously, obviously if the Democrats get in, uh, the whole thing will be uh, put to bed. I mean, that'll be, it'll be finished under a Biden uh, uh, government, surely. Uh, precisely, uh, you know, that, that, that's the fear. Uh, well, I understand that Biden is on record saying that he will not move the embassy back to Tel Aviv if he gets elected, which in fact is, 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 is a, a fact that makes haste even more important because once you get things done, once you have uh, a fait accompli, then it was much more difficult for a democratic government to undo that and still pretend that it's pro-Israel. Hmm. Uh, Martin, there's a new bill that's been uh, uh, put out by the Knesset uh, Land of Israel Lobby I think that's Chaim Katz and Bezal Smotrich. Uh, what's this? Uh, what's who is the the Knesset Land of Israel lobby, and what is this bill that they've proposed? Well, I, I must admit that, I, that I'm not really familiar with the details of it, but there, there is a collection of right wing. Uh, I don't like the term right wing. I prefer hawkish rather than uh, than right and, and uh, dovish rather than left, because the differences in Israel are not classic left right. Uh, I, I'm not sure of the details of the, of the bill, but, but Smotrich and, and uh, especially Smotrich himself has been very, very vocal and active in pushing for uh, uh, annexation and he's, you know, uh, with uh, Naftali Bennett. Uh, and, and, and so this is uh, the, 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 the right wing factions in the Knesset are pushing and trying to get Netanyahu to move ahead with the, with the annexation. Yeah. Um, Martin, we, we, there are a lot of analysts around the world, such as Dan Shapiro, who was um, one of Obama's ambassadors to Israel. They're all saying a very similar thing. They're saying they're warning, they're warning Israel that un unilateral annexation is going to harm harm interests, and and they and they're predicting that uh, um, that that, that uh, by not taking a stable situation or introducing something. Uh, like like the extension of sovereignty will very likely lead to a breakdown of cooperation. What what's your view? I mean, they all seem to think that there's going to be trouble if Israel goes ahead and does this. What's your view of this? We had we, we had the same warnings before with the, the the recognition of Jerusalem, the transfer of the the embassy to uh, to Jerusalem. But every time that Israel has taken a, or Israel has been able to induce an assertive action by itself or either by its American allies, they've been warned, there's been this, these warnings of doom and gloom and uh, uh, hellfire and uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so far, nothing has happened. Um, look, uh, you, you know, the, the people who've uh, uh, supported two statism. Uh, over time have been proved uh, consistently wrong. Uh, and you know, what else would they say? The only way that they could save the, 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 any, the last vestige of the, the vision that they've been pushing for, the, the vision that they've been pushing for, excuse me, uh, they, they've been pushing for the last three decades is about to evaporate. Uh, so, so, so what else can they do? I, I really don't see, I really don't think that the Palestinians now have a stomach for, for a large scale uprising. Uh, I, I, I think, you know, as, as the saying goes, fortune favors the brave. And I, I really think that, uh, that this would go through with no more than a ripple of, uh, of, of opposition. Yeah. Now, 
Martin, there's been an extraordinary resistance by some Jewish organizations worldwide to Israel's proposed extension of sovereignty. How do you explain the reaction by the liberal progressive left-wing Jews? Um, for example, Rabbi Eric Yoffe, former president for the Union of Reformed Judaism, wrote in Haaretz that American Jews are not happy. How do you explain this strong uh, criticism of, of what uh, Israel proposes? Well, I, you know, I don't think there can, any, there can be anything more perverse or paradoxical than the liberal support for, or Palestinian status. Because I don't know any two-stater, however enthusiastic, who thinks that a Palestinian state will not be more or less what Gaza has turned into, a homophobic, misogynistic, Muslim-majority tyranny, which in all likelihood will be a base for jihadi terror. Now, one wonders why people who, uh, who, who profess to, to subscribe to values like gender equality, uh, religious freedom, uh, societal pluralism, uh, et cetera, et cetera, would basically support something that is the diametric antithesis of the values that they, they promote. Why would anyone do that? And you know, for me, this is, this, this is a massive uh, paradox and, and something that Israel has not focused on. Because I've never heard anyone, even you know, official, official of, of Israel who opposed two-state solution, have, have warned what, what two-state solution would be. If you want the ultimate indictment of two-statism, look at Gaza. You know, why, you know, why would why is Gaza and the people I have like Eric Joffe and, and Shimon Peres and people who support the Palestinian uh, national claim told us that Gaza would become the Singapore of the Middle East. Now, the, the jury is no longer out. And you cannot be intellectually honest and carry on to support, carry on supporting two-statism because the, 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 it has no empirical support and it's got no theoretical foundation. At, you know, at, at some stage, you have to, you, you have to uh, just jettison the idea because you, you remember when two states was the to survive and two states became the, the, the flagship of Israeli foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis the, the Palestinian issue. There were uh, proponents who promised sweeping benefits and there were uh, opponents who warned of grave risks. Now, three decades, one third of a century later, uh, you know, the results are in. Uh, all the, all the, uh, the, all the uh, dangers that the uh, opponents warned of, in fact, did materialize. And none of the benefits that the proponents uh, promised uh, came about. So uh, at, at one stage, at some stage, you, you have to, you, you have to um, decide that it doesn't work. How long are you going to carry on with this insane policy? Yeah. So when you, ask, when, you, when, you, when you ask why the liberals support it, I have no idea why any liberal would support something like the Palestinian state, which is the antithesis of the values that they, that, that, that they purport to, to, to subscribe to. Yeah, Martin, but w when you point this out to the, to the progressives, when you say to them, look, what you're proposing has already been tried in Gaza and failed, what do they say? I mean, do they, do they acknowledge that there's, that there's a problem with the, the inherent concept? How do they sort of wriggle out of it? Well, I'm, I'm, you know, I've never had any, any convincing, convincing uh, refutation. Uh, you know, some of them say, well, yes, we haven't tried enough, or maybe it, the idea is good, but the, but the, the imputation was bad. You know, that, that, that's an argument that reminds me of someone who climbs up to the fifth story and he says, I'm going, to, I'm going to learn to fly like a bird. And he throws himself off the fifth story balcony, crashes uh, on, on, on the pavement, and afterwards, he eventually gets out of hospital, takes off his bandages and says, well, you know, the idea was good. Uh, it was, there was a problem with implementation. I'm going to jump off the fifth story. <laughs> you know, that's... Yeah. I mean, if you look, if you look back in history, out of all the the national freedom movement that emerged from the breakup <clears> of <throat> empire, I think the 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 movement that was most successful 
and achieve the best results in terms of, of economic welfare, personal freedom, and, and uh, national independence for its people was, was the Zionist movement. The movement that, that uh, had the, uh, and by the way, the Zionist, uh, at, at the point of departure, the Zionist movement had the least chance of success. But if you, if you, if, if you look at the Palestinian uh, movement, they had the, the best chance of success. They had wall-to-wall -wall support, superpower, uh, in, endorsement, or, uh, media, favorable media coverage, uh, huge financial support, uh, and, and the, all they've managed to achieve after three decades is, is either a, a tyrannical uh, theocracy in Gaza or a corrupt kleptocracy in, in Judea and Samaria. And, uh, and, and chronic uh, chaos in, 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 in both of them. So, uh, you, you know, I, I don't understand why anyone would think that this is going to work. I mean, you know, it's, it's, to me, it's one of the great mysteries of, of, of the modern day. Mm. Martin, uh, the West Bank has never been recognized by international authorities as belonging to Arabs. So how can this so-called annexation be illegal according to international law? I'm a bit confused. Well, I'm, I'm not sure. You know, it all depends. The international laws are rather amorphous uh, topic, and uh, I, I, I'm sure that, that some people would find that it's, that it's legal. And there are people in um, in, in Israel who, who uh, I think it was uh, Eugene Kantorovitz and Avi Bell who talked about the legality of it. Uh, I, I agree with you, and I don't think that Israel has put this point strongly enough. In, in many ways, one of the problems is the makeup of the Israeli bureaucracy, especially in the Justice uh, Department, which is heavily loaded with, uh, with left-wing views, and, and, and by the way, the, the, the Foreign Ministry as well, uh, the, the, the heavily loaded with people with uh, a left-wing perspective on, on, on the Middle East. And in, and in many ways, sad to say, is they, they, they seem to favor the Palestinian narrative at the expense of the Zionist narrative, which is you know, a, a difficult thing. But in many ways, this is a, 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 an indictment of Israel's right wing they have not been assertive enough to insert the, the, their own people into these, these positions. Uh, you, you know, it was Ayelet Sheket who tried to make some change, and uh, Amir Rukhana who tried to make some change. But anyone, anytime anyone tries to touch the, the, uh, either the way the judges are, are, are selected or uh, the way the legal system is, uh, is run, are immediately attacked by as as if they're uh, as, as if they're uh, under, undermining democracy. You know, one would think that having the country run by an unelected uh, uh, bureaucracy is more democratic than anything else is being suggested. So, yeah. Uh, uh, Martin um, Eugene Kontorovich is recognised as the preeminent expert on international law, and he's made the point that the Obama administration required Israel to ethnically cleanse the territory of Jews as a condition of peace. Now, no Israeli government has ever proposed evacuating Palestinians from the area, yet the expulsion of Jews is the, the minimum demand for any Palestinian negotiations. Where do you sit on this issue, and what is your proposal for Judea and Samaria? Well, uh, you know, from my point of view, for Israel to endure over time, it has to adequately address two imperatives. The one imperative is the geographic imperative, which means it cannot make uh, large scale or even any uh, territorial concessions in Judea and Samaria, which completely control the heavily, uh, the heavily populated uh, uh, coastal plain. And uh, the other is uh, the demographic imperative, which means you need to keep the non-Jewish section of the population uh, at, a, at a certain level. And even within the green lines, in, within the green line, uh, this is becoming problematic at the moment with uh, almost 20% Muslim population within Israel's green line. So, uh, you, you know, it's, it's, it's like a scissors. If you, you, a scissors needs two blades to cut. If, if you just focus on geography, it won't cut, and if you just focus on demography, it won't cut. So you have a situation in Israel today where the left wing is prepared to sacrifice geography to preserve the demography, and the right wing, at least most of the right wing proposals that I know, 
uh, are prepared to to sacrifice the demography to to preserve the geography. I, I think that, that if you, that if you accept that analysis, you are forced to a logical conclusion that the, the only way to preserve Israel as a nation state of the Jewish people in the long run is to address both those imperatives, which means you have to keep the territory and somehow diminish the non-Jewish presence within the territory you need for your sovereign uh, uh, for, for, for your sovereignty. Now, there are only two routes to go. The one is a coercive route and the one is a non-coercive route. I certainly suggest that, uh, that uh, we adopt a non-coercive uh, route, and this is by uh, offering uh, generous relocation grants to the Arab population there so they can find a better, more prosperous, more secure life in third party countries outside the circle of violence which has been wrought on them by the corrupt and uh, cruel cliques who led them astray for decades. Uh, and, you, you know, if, if you compare on a moral level, if you compare two statism with what I call the humanitarian solution, uh, which sounds more enlightened? Setting up a homophobic, misogynistic, Muslim majority tyranny on the one hand, like you have in Gaza, or offering non-belligerent Palestinians a better and more secure and more prosperous life elsewhere. You know, I, I, I think if, if, if you neutralize the Israel from that equation, everyone would agree that the second option is, is the most liberal, the most humane, the most enlightened. So, so uh, I, I, I cannot understand why people have not uh, pushed this. Uh, you know, what's, what's going to happen in Gaza? If, you, if you're not talking about large scale, removal of populations from Gaza. What's going to happen to Gaza in 50 years' time? Or 15 years' time? What, what, there's the, 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 the no natural resources. The, the land's being polluted. What, what's going to happen there if you don't do that? I, I, don't, you know, I think people have become so captive to the, uh, the political correct uh, uh, dictates of two states is, is that, that they can't lift their, their eyes up to the horizon. Mm. So you're proposing that Israel incentivize um, Palestinians to leave, and I mean, do you have any concept of how much would be required? Is this a, is this a, a feasible proposition? Well, you know, it, 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 it's a feasibility. You know, you could ask the same question about two states. Is two states a feasible a feasible proposition? Uh, how do you decide whether it's feasible or not? Because they've been trying to implement a two-state solution for three decades now, with massive international support and huge financial resources. And nothing has happened. So when do you decide that two states is no, is no longer feasible? Uh, yeah. but I, the, the, the question, the, the question is, you know, I, I suppose it would cost something like one year of GDP of of, of, of Israel, a year of GDP. Uh, you know, but, of course, Martin, uh, but Martin, where would they go? I mean, Egypt are building a wall to keep the Palestinians out. Uh, it, the Lebanese keep them in in camps outside of Beirut. The 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 uh, oil rich. Uh, uh, oil kingdoms don't want them. Um, which, which place would you propose uh, for them to go? Well, you know, let, let me let me answer you say on, on, on three different levels. First of all, the people trying to leave Gaza are penniless. Uh, if, if you, I, I could I could give you a slew of articles saying how many how many people in Gaza would like to leave. Uh, and, and, and Turkey has become the promised land of, 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 of the Gaza. Now, this is this is all without there being being a a, a, a comprehensive set of uh, positive incentives for leaving and negative disincentives for for, for staying. I mean, you know, I, I'm talking about giving a, a average family, a say, of, of, of four kids, something like uh, between two two hundred and fifty to three hundred thousand dollars. Now, someone who arrives like that in most countries in the world is pretty, is pretty, is pretty well off. Uh, and, and they would be, I think, uh, uh, quite welcome uh, immigrants in, in those countries. We're not talking about people now who are trying, you know, with $10,000 trying to take a boat uh, to, to Italy or somewhere like that. We're, we're talking about people being, being funded with, with, with considerable resources and arriving, arriving in, 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 in an array of countries. Uh, that would, I think, well, why would they not accept them if, if, if they, if they qualify to, uh, according to the immigration uh, criteria? 
I mean, there's a very large Palestinian uh, population in Chile, for instance. That was true, most of them are Christian, but it's a very, it's a very successful uh, community there. Uh, I, I think I think you can go anywhere. You know, I, I once uh, was asked to lecture on uh, Indo Indo Indian Israeli relations um, a couple of years ago, and uh, one of the participants from the Indian side uh, was a, was a young parliamentarian, and uh, he said to me, "What do you think of the Palestinian issue?" So I gave him this whole proposal for funded uh, funded immigration. And he said to me, you know, well, that, that sounds pretty reasonable to me. Tell me, how many Palestinians are there? So I said, well, there's a big argument about this. Some people say they overestimate, some people say they underestimate, but no one thinks they're more than 5 million. So he says, 5 million? Is that all? We could take them. So, <laughs> so uh, and, and then I remember having a chat with, with the Australian uh, ambassador uh, a couple of years ago, and, uh, you know, I gave him the whole proposal. Uh, and I met him a few days later, and he said, you know, I, I, I spoke to my Arab driver about what you said, and uh, he, he said, uh, well, you, you know, they wouldn't even have to give them, the Arab driver said, they wouldn't even have to give them the money if they just had countries that would accept them, you would empty, you'd, you'd empty these territories very quickly. So, you, you know, I, I, I just think it's an idea that you have to get used to. I mean, as I said before, why would you not think that, 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 that you should not set up Yet another homophobic uh, Muslim majority tyranny that, that, that would be homophobic, misogynistic, and 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 based mm. or for jihadi terror, rather than offer non-belligerent Palestinians a better and more prosperous life elsewhere. What could be the possible ethical objection to that? Yeah, yeah. We'll go, to, we'll go to questions in a moment. Just a reminder to people: if you want to ask a question, please click the little reactions button. Uh, on the bottom, and uh, that will electronically raise your hand, and we'll see you there. So, so you can have a think about that. But Martin, I mean, in talking about where they would go, I mean, Jordan would 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 be the obvious first first name that that pops up. And I noticed a few days ago, a former Jordanian ambassador said that that the Arab countries must acknowledge that they've been defeated militarily, politically, and diplomatically. Um, uh, uh, do you think there's there's poss possible possibilities to develop on that with Jordan? Well, not under the present uh, under the present regime. I don't think that, that the Hashemite regime would be disposed to bringing in uh, millions more uh, non hashemites that might undermine his uh, undermine the stability of the regime. There was already, by the way, uh, absorbed millions of refugees from Syria from Iraq. And the, the regime is, 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 uh, is unstable. You know, if it came along with a big financial package, perhaps. But again, you, you, you know, um, the difference between what I'm suggesting and what most other people suggest is virtually any other proposal requires the, 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 uh, the agreement or the consent of some Arab collective entity. What I'm suggesting doesn't require that at all. All it requires is the accumulation of individual decisions of, uh, of uh, uh, Palestinians, individual Palestinians who've been, uh, you know, faith, uh, faith stricken and in a bad way to accept a package that will improve their lives. I don't require the, the, the formal agreement of any uh, Arab entity. All you need is, is these, these uh, underprivileged or underprivileged or, or, or suffering Palestinians, if you really believe they are suffering. To, to, to accept uh, a financial package which will allow them to improve their lives, improve their security, improve their prospects elsewhere. Uh, and and in, in terms of money, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's not uh, uh, unimaginable. I, I believe that with something like one third of what the Americans spent on the war against terror in Afghanistan and Iraq, you could easily finance uh, the, mm. this uh, and, and, as, and as far as the movement of people go, I mean, you know, if you, if, if, let's suppose, a, you know, a, a hypothetical situation where they all move to Indonesia, that would be less than either it's just a, well, one or two percent increase in the Indonesian population and billions of dollars of influx of, uh, of resources into the Indonesian economy. So, you know, it's, it seems like a win-win proposal to me. Mm. Martin, just before we go to questions, just my, uh, one last question for you. The hatred for Bibi Netanyahu appears to be reaching 
Trump-like proportions by some Jews within Israel and the diaspora, how different would a solely-led Gantz government be in real terms to a Netanyahu government? Sorry, can you? Uh, I didn't quite catch the question. Can you say it? Can you ask me again? I, I said that the hatred of Bibi is is becoming like Trump-like proportions. How different would a Gantz uh, government be to a Bibi government? In real, the what are the main I differences? I, I, I wouldn't like to consider that prospect because I, I really don't think that, that Gantz has got what it takes to to to, to govern the country. And, and, you know, and when you say uh, there, there has been a lot of hate uh, for Netanyahu, but he's still by, by far the, the, the most popular candidate for, uh, um, for, for prime minister. In fact, I even saw a strange article by, by Eric Joffrey that you mentioned earlier, saying that uh, how, how, no matter how much he detests Netanyahu, he must stay in power because he's the only one who can deal competently with the corona. That was a couple of months ago. Um, but uh, um, as I say, when you say, when you say he's, he's, being, he's uh, uh, being hated by, by, by large circles, that, that's true. But I, I think he's also more and more popular. If, up until the corona crisis, if you, if you looked at the polls, he was soaring in the polls with the, the, the could uh, polling over uh, 40, uh, uh, 40 seats in the Knesset. So you know, I, I, again, you, you know, I think the, the anti netanyahu voices are very loud, and very vociferous, but, but I'm not quite sure how, they, how representative they are of, of, of the, the public here, who seem to be electing him again and again and again. Uh, and this, you know, you know the, 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 the interesting thing is, despite the, the, the indictments against him, he's still very firmly in control of the country with a lot of public support. No one, no, no, no one near him uh, polls the same numbers as, as being suitable for, for prime minister. So, you know, I would, I would uh, take uh, the anti-Bibi uh, haters in, in, in proportion uh, because, you know, and what you're hearing is, is perhaps the sound of their frustration rather than the sound of their popularity. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Thank you, Alan. Okay. Um, we'll take a few questions. Um, uh, our executive director, Ted Lapkin, has got the first one, and then we'll go to Yossi and Steve. So, Ted, fire away. Thanks a lot. Um, well, I think I have, a, I have an answer to your question, why Bibi's reticence, and I think it derives from the fact that I've spent most of my political life as a political, uh, my life as a political advisor, and hence I'm something of a political cynic. Uh, remember that Bibi signed the Y Accords he also agreed to a settlement freeze of 10 months. So uh, I, I'm not sure that he's such, I mean, he, he talks the talk of a, of a Chirut Beganist ideologue, but I think really at this juncture, his, uh, his prime motivation is smearing Mandelblit and staying out of prison. What's your response to that? Well, you must remember that certainly with the, the uh, settlement freeze, there was a very different atmosphere in the White House. At the, at the, at the moment, if anything, the, the, the White House, up until recently at least, was more, uh, more uh, enthusiastic, uh, hawkishly enthusiastic than, than, than Bibi was uh, himself. Uh, you know, the, the cases that you're talking about, is, is he had pressure from, from Washington to, to, to make those moves. At the moment, I don't see any uh, pressure, or very little pressure, uh, on him from Washington, and uh, much of the, uh, Trump's base uh, is in, enthusiastically in favour of this. So I, I, I'm not, not not sure. I mean, I, I think in, in in many ways it's a lack of confidence that, uh, as I said before, uh, originates from the lack of support that Israel has managed to garner in, in the international community because of its poor uh, public diplomacy strategy. And, and, and because that, that strategy has been starved of, uh, of, uh, of resources. I, you know, you know I, I, I don't want to be too, too, too uh, uh, abrasive, but when, when, when I say <clears throat> that a Palestinian state will be the antithesis of what the liberals believe in, 
as a homophobic, misogynistic, Muslim majority tyranny. I've never seen any Israeli politician or any Israeli diplomat presenting that as the future vision for the Palestinian state. You know, they're all saying uh, uh, Palestinians should be partners for peace, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I, 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 really, I really think that is, Israel has made a mistake in not presenting the Palestinians as they really are, as an implacable enemy rather than a prospective uh, uh, partner for peace. Because as long as you are hoping that the Palestinians will morph into prospective partners for peace, you can never conduct a, 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 uh, an appropriate policy to further your interests because you're, you're, you're dealing with basically with, with a virtual reality and not, and, and not reality on the ground. Mm. Okay, uh, Yosef, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Have we got Yosef, Yosef Weinstein? No? Okay. Um, we'll Steve, go to... Steve Lieblick has a question. And, yep. Uh, next. We'll go to Steve. Welcome, Steve. Hi. Okay. Hello, everyone. And... Um, Welcome, Martin. It's great to see you in Western Australia, even if only virtually. And keep up the good work. You had a question, Steve? Yes. My question relates to the opposition to um, extension of sovereignty. Um, obviously, that's coming from the um, so-called peace movement and the two staters. But there is also opposition coming from residents of... Um, of, of the area from the settler movement. Um, I understand it's because um, accepting the Trump plan comes with a commitment to a Palestinian state on part of the area. Uh, um, but I, I'd be interested in your comments on that particular opposition and whether it, uh, yeah, the tactics involved in, uh, in that. Well, I think that opposition is a bit short-sighted and uh, a little bit mean spirited because you know the idea if you if if you um, uh, going to adhere to the Trump, the Trump plan, the kind of conditions that the Palestinians have to fulfil to achieve statehood are something that even if they wanted to to, uh, to fulfil them that they never do. Yeah. Yeah. Hold tight there, Yosef. We'll come to you after Steve. And uh, Martin okay. finishes answering. So, uh, I mean, you, re you really have to believe in science fiction to believe that, it, that, uh, that the Palestinians would fulfill the conditions that uh, the Trump plan <coughs> calls for uh, to achieve statehood. And I think that basically by annexing what you could annex would put uh, Palestinian statehood uh, off, the gen off the agenda uh, completely. Uh, so I, I, you know, you know, I think that they, they are uh, they're, they're being a little short-sighted and myopic in this uh, in, in, in this regard, because if you uh, uh, if, if you miss this opportunity, you'll never know what's going to come down the line. And by once you finally annex it as a, as an irrevocable uh, political step, I think the issue of Palestinian status will just crumble. That of course leaves you with the problem: of what are you going to do with the Arabs? But then we go back to what we were talking about. Yeah. Uh, uh, but uh, I, I, I think that, uh, you, you know, yeah. I, I just, uh, you know, my, 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 David, maybe you should mute, uh, mute Yosef for a moment. Find him. Okay. My, uh, my, my, my fear is that this just may, you know, uh, annoy the, administra the administration and say, well, you know, we've done so much for you. We've moved the embassy, we've recognized Jerusalem, we stopped funding for the Palestinians, we've, we've uh, recognized Israeli sovereignty in, in the Golan, uh, we've pulled out of the Iranian deal, uh, and, and now you want to nitpick with us, uh, and then they, they, they may uh, withdraw their support for it. So I, I think it's, uh, it's, it's uh, very uh, short sighted and, and, and even risky. Uh, you know, it's, uh, by trying to eat too much, you might, get up, you might end up eating nothing. Yeah, Martin, just expanding on that a bit now that the, the, the so-called settlers um, are part of the opposition to the Trump peace plan, um, is that because they don't want to give away part of Judea and Samaria? They, they, they feel that it should all be under Israeli control? 
Well, that's that's uh, part of the the uh, uh, the opposition. But as Steve said before, the the the, the, the uh, principle of the opposition is that it involves Israel recognizing a pal the possibility of a Palestinian state in the future. But uh, you, you know, there was once 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 the the motto of the Mossad was uh, make war by deception. Uh, so I think that we should, they should uh, that Israel should take what it can get now, and I believe that events will eventually lead to to the rest, because yeah. once uh, once those areas are under Israeli sovereignty, I think Palestinian state will be far the possibility will be far more remote than it is that it ever was. Okay, um, Yosef, are you still there? Would you like to ask a question? If so, please please unmute yourself. Thank you very much. Um, my question is very simple. Is it appropriate to continue using the word annexation? Uh, uh, perhaps not. You, you know, it's just for ease of communication. You know, it's much easier to say we'll annex rather than we'll extend sovereignty over. I mean, I, I take your point. I mean, probably for, for, for linguist pur purists, the correct term is to extend Israeli sovereignty over the area. And, and not and, and not annex it because that gives the, the connotation of you annexing something that doesn't belong to you and extending sovereignty over uh, over the area. So sort of we're just we're just uh, you know uh, bringing the situation to what it should be by extending our our, our laws to something that is already ours. Uh, but uh, you, you know I think there's so many there's so many substantive arguments. To arrive at the situation which we should arrive at, rather than get involved uh, too much in, the, in, in in semantics. Although I, I take your point, your point is is it at least theoretically a valid point. The same as people saying you shouldn't use Palestinians as Palestinian Arabs or something like that. I, you know, I, I I agree with it, but the, the, the discourse has developed such that that's just become the shorthand uh, for for communicating an idea. Yes, yes. The word annex is just a, a nice short little word rather than extend sovereignty over. So it yeah. tends to get used a lot um, for convenience, but it's not terribly accurate. Um, I've, I'll, I'll pose a question to you from Volvi. And if anybody else wants to ask questions, now's the time to put your hand up. Um, who, in your opinion, is likely to succeed uh, Bibi Netanyahu? Oh, that's an interesting, uh, an interesting question. Uh, I, I don't know who would be most likely, but I know who I would like to succeed in. One of the, one of the two best candidates, in, in my opinion, are Yuli Edelstein and, and Neil Balkai. Mm. Those are the two, the, two, the, two, the two best candidates. Interesting choice. Yeah, what about uh, Naftali Bennett and uh, Ayelet no. Shaked? They're not in the Likud. No. As, as long as they're in a separate party, I don't think they have much chance. Uh, right. Don't you think Yuli Edelstein uh, besmirched his reputation with his antics towards the end of his tenure as Speaker of the Knesset? I think his uh, fortunes have dimmed as a result of that. No, I'm not sure. I think he showed a lot of a backbone by not uh, by not accepting the the High Court dictate to to hold the uh, the the meeting that they were that they were told to hold. So I, I'm not sure. I think he I, 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 whatever he might have lost. Prior to that, I think he made back in the last two or three days of his of his incumbency. Mm. Okay. So if if, if, if to, to to join the Likud, you know, they, they, they may be good good candidates, uh, but uh, as, as long as they're in in a small splinter party, I don't think that it's uh, it's, it's on the cards. Okay. Um, anybody else want to ask a question? While you're thinking, I'll ask uh, ask one that, I, that, that I've had in mind uh, for a little bit. Um, Yoram Ettinger is a name that we, we, we're familiar with, and he writes that the conventional wisdom says that an Israeli application of its law to the Jordan Valley and parts of Judea and Samaria would threaten the, uh, the peace process between Israel and Jordan and Israel and Egypt. Um, um, what, what do you think about that? Is that uh, should we be overly worried about about that part of the um, the situation? Uh, my short answer is no, uh, but uh, I, I think that uh, it certainly won't threaten our relationship with, with Jordan. I think 
nothing could could stabilize the current regime for however long you think it will be stable, then then separating it from a, a potentially ill-dentist Palestinian population in in Judea and Samaria. So I think if 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 anything, Israeli sovereignty in in, in the Jordan Valley would stabilize the current regime, perhaps longer than it's a natural life at the moment. And I think in any way, Israel's long-term strategic uh, a calculation must be that the Hashemite regime has a limited shelf life anyway. I mean, we should perhaps try to extend it, but, but I think that uh, it, it, it has a, a limited shelf life anyway. Uh, and, and, and no one really knows where, where the successor regime would be better or worse, or the co- on, the, uh, you know, on the surface of it, it looks like it would probably be less friendly than the, the, uh, than, than the current regime. But I, I, I think if anything, uh, although they would never do this publicly, I think the Hashemite regime would applaud Israeli uh, sovereignty over the, the, the Jordan Valley uh, because it would be a step to stabilize and perhaps lengthen the incumbency of that, uh, of that regime. Is that the, the, the prevailing view, that the Jordanians are, are the, less, the less obnoxious of the, uh, the Arab states and therefore we sh- Israel should be you know, fostering a peace is that is that is that the way people look at it? Well, at, at the moment, you know, there are facts on the ground. It's, it's Israel's longest border. It's certainly be relatively calm uh, for quite a long time now. So, you know, I, I don't think many people could uh, could argue with that. Uh, uh, you know, I, I, I'm I'm very, very skeptical about the intentions of any Arab regime. Uh, I, I think it's just a function of power relations. You know, people talk about the legality of the situation. If Israel was perceived that the, as, as a weaker party, I think the only law that would prevail in this region is the law of the jungle. So, uh, so you know, uh, I'm not sure that uh, legal uh, considerations are the, the, the overriding supreme consideration. Um, but, uh, uh, you, you know, I, th- I, I, I think that uh, the, the eastern border is, has, has been relatively calm. Uh, and uh, I don't think we've got that much to complain about. So, uh, as I say, I'm, I'm, I'm very wary of accepting any uh, Arab state as one that would be a reliable ally in the long run. Mm-hmm. I, I, I have a question if, uh, if nobody else uh, <laughs> wants to jump in. Uh, Car- uh, Carolyn Glick published a book a couple of years back advocating the one state solution. And uh, like everything else in Israel, dem- demography is a very highly politicized issue. Um, uh, what's, your, what's your take? I mean, I, I heard your, uh, your, your plan in terms of encouraging voluntary emigration, but her, her, her plan was just, yeah, just annex it. There are fewer Arabs because uh, the Palestinian Authority has been cooking, cooking the books and and, and falsifying the figures, just give everybody uh, uh, all the Arabs Israeli citizenship, and we'll cope. Well, I'm, I, I read a few articles criticizing that that approach. I'd be happy to send them to you if you if you let me know how I can do that. Uh, I think uh, I, I, I don't think that the the major idea is an electoral majority of the Arabs. I think even a 30 or 40 percent uh, minority. Of Arabs uh, in Israel would imperil Israel as a as a uh, as a nation state of the Jews. It's basically almost an inevitable recipe for the Lebanization of Israeli of Israeli society. I mean, how, what would the national anthem be if uh, if 40 uh, percent of the population not only do not accept but vehemently reject the words of Atikva, the the, the the Star of David? Uh, dominance of Hebrew as a means of communication. So as, as I said before, you know, Israel can endure only if it keeps the, the non-Jewish majority, and I'm not even talking about, this is talking about a hostile major, uh, minority, if it keeps the, the, the non, non-Jewish minority down to acceptable levels, and it's certainly well below 40% or 45% or whatever you believe uh, of the, uh, the, the population there. So it's not just a matter of uh, electoral uh, uh, arithmetic at the point of departure, and, and I think that will generate dynamics that will make Israel far less attractive 
for Jews abroad to come and live here and for Jews here to stay. So I, I think it's uh, I think it's a very risky proposition. Yeah. I'm very much I, I agree. I, I think it's nuts. Okay. Martin, 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 just lastly, what's the legal situation with Bibi? Uh, people are asking uh, or, or, or commenting, is he going to be convicted and et cetera, et cetera. What, what's the up, update? Legal, legal. Uh, and for, unfortunately, I think, and I've written about this quite extensively, I think, unfortunately, truth is only going to have a marginal role to play here. I think it's going to be a, it's going to be a, a, a clash of forces. Uh, you know, if, if, you, if, if you ask me, even if everything they're saying about Bibi is true, my question is, so what? I mean, you know, they, these really, they, in my opinion, they seem really trumped up charges against him. Uh, and, and I would be dismayed if if he were convicted on, on any of them. Uh, and he, you know, even if even if he, he behaved inappropriately, I think the proper thing would be administrative punishment, like a fine or holding back salary or something. But certainly not criminal charges. I mean, it, it, in, in, without going too much into the detail, we're at the end of the interview. So I, I really think it's uh, it would be really unfortunate. No good result can come out of this. Because if he's if he's if he if he's convicted, half the country will lose faith in in the, in, in the legal establishment. And if he's acquitted, the other half will lose faith will lose faith in the uh, uh, legal uh, legal establishment. So I think the whole initiative to indict him was very very poorly considered. Mm. I agree. I agree. Yeah. Um, Martin, we're coming up to the uh, the close. Um, just before I I hand back to David to to uh, mention a few things. Just tell everybody um, about your uh, your organization and the website, please. Well, we've set up this organization to try and combat the prevailing uh, dictatorship of political correctness in most intellectual endeavor in Israel. Fortunately, this has become a little uh, better in the last few years, but basically we're, we're trying to uh, promote a paradigm for the the, the conduct of the affairs of the nation, which are far more resolute uh, and, and assertive than that, which has been the, the case for the last three, three decades. And we're trying to go back to the roots of self-confidence of the Zionism in the, in, in, the, in, in, in the morality and the necessity of a, a nation state for the Jewish people. Okay, David? We've got one last question from David Schulberg. He's been trying to ask one. So, David, you can un unmute yourself and ask your question. Off you go, David. Uh, good to hear you once again. Hi, David. How, how, how are you doing? I, I've long uh, admired uh, what you do and, and say on Israel's strategic interests. I just uh, can't buy this um, idea of... Um, paying the Palestinians to leave. The, in, in Gaza, there's uh, so much being done by, the, by, by Hamas to stop Palestinians leaving, to stop a brain drain. Uh, they are spreading all sorts of uh, stories about the dangers for them uh, escaping as refugees and what could befall them. And uh, I can see that the, the Palestinians were not interested in the pay that would come from the Trump plan. Money isn't uh, their interest, they're, they're ideologically focused. So even if Israel was to give them a billion dollars to leave, Qatar would probably come in and give them another billion dollars to stay. It is, just isn't going to work, I don't think, uh, Martin. Well, first of all, let me say, we'll never know unless we try. We know one thing for sure, two-statism isn't working, and we've tried that for three mm. decades. But, uh, but uh, let me say something else. All the plans, whether you're talking about my plan or Caroline's plan or Naftali Bennett's plan, the precondition is to, to uh, enter the areas now under, under control by the Palestinians, whether it's in Gaza or in Judea and Samaria, uh, and disarm and dismantle the, the current, uh, the, the, the current uh, administration there. Uh, and uh, no, no, no alternative to two-state to, to plan, okay, whether it's Caroline's or whether it's mine, uh, doesn't involve that, or Bennett's plan as well. It all involves dism dismantling the current Palestinian administration and Israel taking over the, 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 uh, 
the control of the territory. Now Israel can take over the control over the territory and continue to run the lives of the Palestinians, or it can uh, it can implement an initiative to reduce the number of Palestinians whose lives it has to run. And I'm suggesting the the the, the, the second. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. Well, um, it's time it's time to wrap up. We're we're at time, uh, Martin. Uh, firstly, I want to thank you so much for making your time available. Um, your expertise and insights are always interesting. And uh, Martin is a prolific writer in the Jerusalem Post, and he does a regular uh, feature called Into the Fray. And uh, we'd certainly commend that to anyone who wants to expand their knowledge of strategic interests concerning uh, uh, Israel. Now, uh, one of the things that we want everybody to do is to uh, support AJA, of course. And I'm putting up on the screen now uh, three simple things that, that you can do if you aren't doing these yet. Uh, like and follow the AJA Facebook page. Uh, if you want to be on our email list and be notified uh, of events and uh, what we're doing, uh, all you need to do is send your name and email address to office at jewishassociation.org.au. And of course, we want to encourage you to uh, become members and to tangibly support uh, AJA, and that can be done uh, via the website jewishassociation.org.au.